And we're continuing with the 10th chapter of David Copperfield. Just a little bit left to go. Peggy and Barkus have gotten married. David has confessed his love to Emily. And now Peggy and Barkus are living somewhere else outside of the ship that the rest of the Peggy family lives in. Younger old Davy, as long as I am alive and have this house over my head, said Peggy, you shall find it as if I expected you here directly minute. I shall keep it every day as I used to keep your old little room, my darling. And if you was to go out to China, and if you was to go to, and if you was to go to China, you might think that it was being kept just the same all the time you were away. I went home in the morning with herself and Mr. Barkus in the cart. They left me at the gate, not easily or lightly, and it was a strange sight to me to see the cart go away, to see the cart go on, taking Peggy away, and leaving me under the old elm tree, looking at the house in which there were no faces to look on mine with love or liking any more. I fell into a state of neglect which I cannot look back upon without compassion. I was not actively ill-used. I was not beaten or starved, but the wrong that was done to me had no intervals of relenting, and was done in a systemic, passionless manner. Day after day, week after week, month after month, I was coldly neglected. I wonder sometimes, when I think of it, what they would have done if I had been taken with an illness, whether I should have lain down in my lonely room and languished through it in my usual solitary way, or whether anybody would have helped me out. I now approach a period of my life which I can never lose the remembrance of, while I remember anything, and the recollection of which has often, without my invocation, come before me like a ghost and haunted happier times. I had been out one day loitering somewhere in the listless, meditative manner that my way of life engendered, when, turning the corner of a lane near our house, I came upon Mr. Murdstone walking with a gentleman. I knew him to be a Mr. Qu to be a Mr. Quinian, whom I had seen before. It is no matter. I need not recall when. Mr. Quinian lay at our house that night. After breakfast the next morning, I had put my chair away and was going out of the room when Mr. Murdstone called me back. He then gravely repaired to another table where his sister sat herself at her desk. Mr. Quinian, with his hands in his pockets, stood looking out the window, and I stood looking out, and I stood looking at them all. David, said Mr. Murdstone, to the young, this is a world for action, not for moping and droning in. As you do, added his sister. Jane Murdstone, leave it to me if you please. I say, David, to the, to the young, this world is a world for action, not for moping and droning in. It is especially so for a young boy of your disposition, which requires a great deal of correcting, and to which no greater service can be done than to force it to conform to the ways of the working world, and to bend it and break it. For stubbornness won't do here, said his sister. What it wants is to be crushed, and crushed it must be, shall be, too. He gave her a look, half in remonstrance, half in approval, and went on. I suppose you know, David, that I am not rich. At any rate, you know it now. You have received some considerable education already. Education is costly. And even if it were not, and I could afford it, I am of opinion that it would not be at all advantageous to you to be kept at a school. What is before you is a fight with the world, and the sooner you begin it, the better. I think it occurred to me that I had already begun it in my poor way, but it occurs to me now whether or no. But it occurs to me now whether or no. You have heard. The counting house mentioned sometimes, said Mr. Murdstone. The counting house, sir, I repeated. Of Murdstone and Grinby in the wine trade, he replied. I suppose. I looked uncertain, for he went on hastily. You have heard the counting house mentioned, or the business, or the cellars, or the wharf, or something about it? I think I have heard the business mentioned, sir, I said, remembering what I vaguely knew of his and his sister's resources. But I don't know when. It does not matter when, he returned. Mr. Quinian manages that business. I glanced at the latter deferentially as he stood looking out the window. Mr. Quinian suggests that it gives employment to some other boy. 
and that he sees no reason why it shouldn't, on the same terms, give employment to you. He having, Mr. Quinian observed in a low voice and half turning round, no other prospect, Murdstone. Mr. Murdstone, with an impatient and even angry gesture, resumed, without noticing what he had said. So you are now going to London, David, with Mr. Quinian, to begin the world to begin the world on your own account. In short, you are provided for, observed his sister, and will please do your duty. Though I quite understood that the purpose of this announcement was to get rid of me, I have no distinct remembrance whether it pleased or frightened me. My impression is that I was in a state of confusion about it, and oscillating between two points, touched and all that I was in a state of confusion about it, oscillating between the two points, touched neither. And that is the end of chapter 10.